All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Psycho's Platters, episode 193, Albums, Albums, and More Albums. That's right, this time it is a classic vinyl LP episode. Always powered by coffee, every time, all the time. But you guys already knew that already, because you guys are smart cookies. I could go for some cookies. <laughs> Anywho, um... I got, I don't know if you guys could see it, my Kiss Sonic Boom t-shirt today I'm wearing. Um, I'm surprised I could still fit in it. <laughs> okay, so, anywho, these um, albums are a combination of a couple sources. Um, the first couple here are from a Salvation Army find that I, that I picked up a few weeks back. Um, the album that I'm going to show at the end came from an antique mall in southern Missouri and the albums in between literally were found just on Sunday at a very kind of strange place and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Let's get right into it though. I got a lot of research and I'll try to make this kind of quick but I can't promise. The first three here, like I said, uh, with this story here, uh, it was at a Salvation Army a few weeks back Somebody dumped boxes, like about four to five boxes, like liquor boxes, okay, of jazz, big band, and a little bit of um, group records. Not much, though, okay? The group records pretty much consisted of platters. Uh, if they were in better shape, I would have grabbed them because guess what? Some of those albums I never saw before. And I like the platters. But I'm pretty happy with what I picked up here. First one here Jazz Goes to College, the Dave Brubeck Quartet. Now, uh, this one here, released June 7th, 1954. This was Brubeck's first album for Columbia Records. The lineup here, of course, you've got Dave Brubeck on piano, Paul Desmond on alto sax. Uh, Bob Bates on double bass, and Joe Dodge on the drums. Now, uh, Brubeck's wife, Iola, uh, she suggested a tour of major universities and junior colleges to get a new audience for the medium. Uh, they would tour 90 colleges over a four-month period, mostly recorded, though, at the University of Michigan and Cincinnati and Oberlin College. Um, the one I like off of here, Balcony Rock. I actually like Balcony Rock off of here. I'm going to show you, of course, I always love Columbia Six Eyes. Now, actually, this thing overall is in really good shape. Um, <clears throat> I think I brought this up in another episode that I will always end up picking up Brubeck when I can find it. Uh, this is probably the third Brubeck that I have found in the last two months alone. I just can't seem to find that elusive take five. I, at least in a decent, decent condition, okay? Because guess what? There was a take five in the box, and it was all beat to holy hell. But this one wasn't, so I'm really happy to hang on to this one. This next one, kind of a little bit of a head scratcher. If you're a jazz fan, give me a little bit more enlightenment on this in the comments, please. But this one here on Dot Records. Softly, softly jazz, Eddie Barnes and his high fidels. Now, basically, um, the source on this particular album, other than, of course, the liner notes here, is Unearthed in the Atomic Attic Blog Spot. Okay, so they're the ones that helped me provide this information. This album's from 1957. Uh, Eddie Barnes, of course, plays bass, Bay Perry on drums, and Joe Knight on piano. Uh, Beaumont, Texas in 1924 is where Barnes was from. He worked with Thelonious Monk uh, at a town hall concert. Uh, Bay Perry, he worked with Thelonious also and others. And Joe Knight, 1947 was his first crack with the Hot Lips Page Band. And in 1952 he worked with Earl Bostick and others. Um, but here's the goofy part. I'm, I'm gonna, here's the back two on this, okay? Um... This is on, like I said, the old school dot label. Um, it needs cleaning, but overall it's in really nice shape, too. Uh, um, the thing is about this particular album, and this is why sometimes trying to look at multiple sites does not help. 
I saw range from a couple dollars in this condition to literally 150. So I don't know who to believe. I cannot, you know, like I said, I always go more for the sounds than the value. The value is like icing on the cake to me. But I can't figure this out. Now, uh, we do have a slight little, slight tear in the bottom here. Um, I also happen to like the ones on the back here, which are kind of cool. I'll show you this, like I said, on the back here, the, the persuasive sax of Russ Prokop and America's Greatest Jazz, Rusty Bryant, and his Caroline Club Band, shown for other albums you could pick up for sale. I haven't honestly, had a chance to listen to this yet, but, uh, I mean, I did hear the Brubeck, and I heard a little bit of this next one, which... This one, to me, I am very happy to have. I found this in the last box. From 1957, Earl Fava Hines Solo. Now, uh, my buddy Doug Fields goes off and he says that, uh, you know, um, Hines' solo stuff isn't exactly as great as it could be as opposed to his previous work with, with other musicians. And I guess I kind of get that, but I still actually like this record. I've heard bits and pieces of it. This is on Fantasy. This is the front. This is the back. I, just this cover alone, I had to get this. Now, uh, this was recorded in 56, like I said, even though it was released in 57. Uh, born in December of 1903. <laughs> I have to explain that now, right? Yeah. In, I hope I got this right, Duquesne, Pennsylvania? I hope I got that right. He left home at age 17 to play piano in a Pittsburgh nightclub. In 21, one of the first African Americans to perform on the radio. First record work on Dennett in 1923. 1925, he moves to Chicago, met Louis Armstrong there, and recorded with him for OK Records. Hines also gave Charlie Parker his first big break in the late 30s. Uh, he, Hines would later record with Dave Brubeck, Dizzy Gillespie, and so many others. He passed away in April of 83 in Oakland, California. Now, this here, <clears throat> I'm led to believe, is the first pressing. Why? Okay, this is only the second fantasy album I own. My other one was a Lenny Bruce. I have that. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, I'm not even seeing scratch on this at all. I know it's kind of hard when you have colored vinyl, but I'm going to go with here at least a near mint on this beauty. This thing is just fantastic. But um, this one here, if I remember correctly, I think goes for in a near, you know, in a near mint around a 50 price range. The second pressing I am led to believe is in the black vinyl category. But I'm very happy to have this. I actually like this work. It is piano work, but I like it. Now, the, these next couple albums, there was a strange little sale here in downtown uh, Rogers, Arkansas. Yeah, I'm from near Rogers, Arkansas here, actually. And, um, actually, I struck pretty decent um, at that. I forgot one album I got from an estate sale, too. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute, too. But... This one uh, was a garage sale for a charity, all right? Garage sale for a charity, and um, it had to do with bike trails and stuff like that, okay? And they went off and mentioned in the Facebook thingy, hey, guess what? There's going to be records. Of course, I'm going to go on a Sunday afternoon, and I get there pretty early, you know, from when it opens. So I end up with a still sealed 1985 on Scab Records. PJ and the Terrorists. I have never heard of these guys. It's on the album's called Territory. Like I said, from '85, uh, Scab Records. Uh, the, all the, all this source, by the way, is uh, Discogs. I forgot to tell you, Earl Father Hines was um, was uh, Wiki on that one. Okay, so PJ and the Terrorists Discog information because I kept looking around. I couldn't find Jack Squad uh, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is the second release. From them, the, the uh, they had an EP in '84. It was recorded and mixed in 20 hours at Ambient Sound in St. Paul, Minnesota, in July of '84. Uh, you, like I said, this is a trio here: PJ, Dave Peterson, Randy Casey. 
Um, the only one that got a slight bit of prominence, at least in Minneapolis, is Randy Casey. Uh, he ended up doing a solo album in 2001, and um, and then also worked with the Minneapolis band. Sorry, I can barely read my writing. Uh, Minneapolis band, he worked with Dan Israel and the Cultivators in 2003. So, uh, like I said, I haven't had a chance to listen to this yet, but I'm kind of curious. Somebody told me it's in an alt-rock vein. Um, this next one that I got... From 1979, Mark Benno lost in Austin. I have heard some of these cuts. I actually enjoy this thing. Now, if Mark Benno sounds familiar to you, good for you. If not, that's okay, because Mark Benno actually got his start in the late 1960s. Um, hang on a minute here. Born in July of 47 in Dallas. He started in the late 60s musically with Leon Russell. Yes, Leon Russell. Asylum Choir, which I do happen to have both of those albums. I think if I remember correctly, I at least have Asylum Choir one signed by Leon. Maybe I might have both of them signed by Leon. I can't remember. But like I said, they made the two albums. One was released in 68 on Smash. The second was recorded in 69, but not released till 71 on Shelter. Uh, he played rhythm guitar on four tracks, including L.A. Woman for the Doors album of the same name in early 71. Also worked with Eric Clapton, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and Rita Coolidge. He put out a couple of albums in the 70s, but this one here would be the last one he would do until 1990. Um, all the information, Wikipedia and MarkBenno.com, yes, he's got his own website, which I'm going to bring up. He's got a new album that just came out called Survivor. And if you go click on it, and actually it's a really cool album. I've listened to the samples. CD Baby has it. So it puts you right to CD Baby. Now this particular album here is the front. This is the back on the nice uh, white brown A&M from the late 70s. Who's on this album? How about Albert Lee, Eric Clapton, Jim Keltner, Carl Radle from uh, Derek and the Dominoes and Clapton's band, Dick Sims. Uh, from uh, He was with Clapton since 461 Ocean Boulevard. Of course, he's passed away, too. And Dick Morrissey, who is a British jazz musician who worked with Alexis Corner, um, Ian Stewart and Charlie Watts from The Stones, John Anderson from Yes, Gary Newman, and others. And like I said, really kind of really kind of nice to see this. What's really, really strange, I tripped on this. Uh, they did make in Japan a CD of this. And uh, I'm led to believe that thing goes for 50 to to $100. Seriously, from what I looked at from Discogs and the other one, uh, the other side I looked at. So pretty awesome for that. Back to this really, really quick. This is the one album that I picked up from the estate sale. I did end up getting some 45s and a 78. That'll be in the next episode. But Mary Hopkins postcard. That's right. In the shrink still from, uh, from 1969 on the Apple label, yes. Uh, okay, this one here, produced by Paul McCartney. Uh, February 69, came out in the UK, March 69 in the US. Went to number 3 in the UK, number 26 in Canada, and number 28 in the US charts. Um, now, the US version of this album is actually a little different than the UK version, because the US version has the song Those Were the Days, which that one went to number 1 in the US and the UK markets when it was released. Uh, but those were the days is on the American version, as opposed to if you have the UK version, that she actually has a Gershwin cover of Someone Watch Over Me. Now, uh, uh, she would end up doing one more album on Apple, Earth Song, Ocean Song, from 71. But uh, this came out in 2010, CD remaster, and has a bunch of bonus tracks on it, and uh, including the song Goodbye, which uh, which Paul wrote, even though it says Lennon McCartney, Paul pretty much wrote it. I'm led to believe that uh, that one was a White Album cast-off, Goodbye was, and uh, Mary Hopkins had a hit with that, too. So here's the front, here's the back. This is actually a second copy I happen to find of this, but I paid pennies for this thing. Pennies, and is in near-mint condition. It's beautiful. So I'll probably end up like doing a trade or something, maybe for a different Apple album, because I have a still-sealed... Um, 
from that one. Now, uh, back to that other garage sale I went to, Gary Brooker. Does that name sound familiar to you? Gary Brooker. Gary Brooker was an original member of Procol Harum. Yes, Procol Harum. Lead Me to the Water from 1982. This is the front. This is the back. This is on the, uh, what I call the Skyline Mercury. Okay? Skyline Mercury. Um, there's, this is a lyric sleeve, of course, too. But, uh, I gotta tell you, I played a couple cuts off this thing. Very surprised. I, I ended up having uh, Gary's first solo album from 79. For some reason, I really didn't care for that one very much, but I sure do care about this one a lot more. Now, uh, like I said, this was his second solo album. This particular information coming from Wiki and Cherry Red Records um, as well. So, uh, he was in Procol Harum from 66 to 77, and then it restarted back up in 91, and... Uh, He's the sole member. He is the sole member from that classic lineup. And they just put out a new album called Novum, which I am trying to find, because, yeah, I'm going to review it. Oh, you know I'm going to review it. But uh, after the first solo album in 79, he ended up working with Eric Clapton, uh, 80 and 81 pretty much. He was on the Another Ticket album on RSO from Clapton. Uh, he also contributed to George Harrison albums. He ended up on All Things Must Pass, Somewhere in England and Gone Tropo. Uh, and he also was a member of the uh, Ringo's All-Star Band, too. Now, this here was produced by Gary, and it was mixed and engineered by Colin Thurston, who previously engineered for David Bowie, Iggy Pop, and others. Now, who's, uh, who's on this album, you ask? Phil Collins and Steve Holly, former member of Wings on Drums. Uh, Clapton, Albert Lee... George Harrison, all on guitars. Yes. Uh, Mineral Man. Mineral Man off of this thing. Nice little slide. That's what George is known for, isn't it? Nice little slide. Chris Staten from Spooky Tooth and Clapton's Band and uh, Brooker both do the keys, along with Phil Aberg, who um, he uh, was on uh, Fool Around and Fell in Love from El Elvin Bishop, and he also in the 80s was a Wyndham Hill artist, if you like that kind of stuff. And Mel Collins from uh, King Crimson and Camel and others, he, uh, he does sax on this. Now, um, Cherry Red ended up remastering this thing on CD with two bonus tracks. And you'll have to forgive me, I don't remember the bonus tracks, but I'm led to believe that Eric Clapton's on one of those bonus tracks, too. So, very happy to have that in the collection, too. Now, the last album I'm going to show you for the day here. I was with my oldest son, Michael. I ended up, I showed you previously, I had a, in my 45 episode, I found some Elvis and I found a Skyliners, which was nice, 45s. I looked through a bunch of albums. And when I came to this, it wasn't the best condition copy, but it'll work for me. That's the reason why I kind of wore this Kiss shirt, because this last album here is actually a very cool Kiss collectible. I know. You're going off and you're saying here, Mighty Psycho, we've already seen copies of this Kiss album. Yeah, we probably have it in our collections. Here's the front. Here's the back. Alright. So, let me tell you a little bit about this before I go off and explain what the heck was such a big twang about it. <clears throat> this was released in February either 8th or 18th of 74. You will have to forgive me I have seen conflicted sources of these. So it's one of them, but we're going to go with at least February 74. came out in February 74. It was recorded October, November of 73 at Bell Sound in New York City. By the way, this information courtesy of WikiLeaks and the No Life Till Metal website. That's right. So, uh, Kissin' Time. Yep, Kissin' Time. That one was recorded in April of 74, which was a Bobby Rydell cover was produced by Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise. Now, those names sound familiar because Kenny Kerner was the manager and producer and Richie Wise was the guitarist for the group Dust, which was on the Kama Sutra label. I am so trying to find those albums, honestly. Uh, Dust, other than Richie Wise, had Kenny Aronson and uh, Mark Bell, a.k.a. Marky Ramon, for I think it was two albums on Kama Sutra. I could be wrong on that. But... Kerner and Wise would end up, after ending up doing this album, 
they would uh, the, the following early in the um, oh geez almost a year later they would end up producing the final Badfinger album with Pete Ham Head First which didn't end up getting released till 2000 on Snapper Records actually Head First is a very awesome album but so uh, the album here though was reissued in July 74 to include Kissing Time because and uh, rumor has it, it had, there was some type of DJ involved in the pushing of this. I'm not sure who. KISS fans, please comment below, because I know dang well you'll know more about this than I will. But they're like, so Neil Bogart got all this kissing contest. Uh, the band was going to go and judge like the last few final finalists in the cities or something. I think even the Mike Douglas show, I think, had something like that, too, if I remember correctly from that. Anywho... Big mistake. Oh, oh, I hate that song. I I hated that Bobby Rydell song in the first damn place. And then I'm like, Kiss should have just held their ground. But you know what? I understand. You know, anything to get the first album pushed. You know what I'm saying on it? So here's the thing. Why am I telling you all of this little bit? Because this here is a first pressing. It is not in the best of shape, unfortunately. You can't tell, but the cover's taped all around pretty much I don't know but it is for you kissaholics out there a a Casablanca NB 9001 press yes with without kissing time on there which kissing time would have been if I remember correctly on side two and of course it is not there and uh, the the condition of this album is um, like I said it's not great but it's playable. I spent eight bucks, uh, which is normally probably a lot more than I would have spent. But being that, this was the first time I ever saw an original press of this Kiss album. I had to have it. I, I, I have loved Kiss since the mid-70s. And to be able to have this in my collection, hey, this is, this is a, what do you call it, a, uh, this is a holdover copy. Until I can get myself a better one now. Uh, I want to mention really quick here, of course, this was a classic. Strutter, Nothing to Lose, Firehouse, Cold Gin, Deuce, and Black Diamond all came from this album. Um, I'm, I'm led to believe summer of 77 is when this album finally went gold. Now, the last question I'm going to ask you in regards to this particular album. KISS fans, tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, alright, in the comments below. Uh, originally, I am told that this album sold about 75,000 copies originally when it came out. So what I'm getting at is, is I'm not entirely sure how many of those, are we talking the 75,000 copies before Kissing Time got put on? Or are we talking about 75,000 copies for maybe all of 1974? Either way, this is a deemed pretty much collectible, and I'm glad to have this in the collection I really, really am. I am planning on doing a all kiss episode. Uh, it'll be sometime down the road. I am when I'm in the new place because uh, I'm not ready for that yet. But totally awesome. I have loved these guys. And that was the last big item there that I had here. New subs. That's right. New subs. Pablo Rock, Mark Moe, Troy Snyder, Robert Savage, Mr. Buck. BUC128, Jerome Wright, and Finger Lakes Hiker. Yes, all of them new subs to the channel. Well appreciative on this indeed. Um, Wax Museum with Ronnie Dark. Sunday night, 6 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. And Mike Adams with the Night Owl Lounge, 9 to 10 p.m. Central Standard. And then Wallflower Hour, okay, which would be 10 to 11 Central Standard, all on WVOA Radio, 87.7, uh, out of Syracuse, New York. Go like all of their respective Facebook pages. Ronnie, Mike, Kathy, Tim, there's a whole bunch of people in there. All class acts, all class acts. You will not be disappointed by any of those radio shows. Um, Freak Beat with Ken Worth, The Spy, 107.5 out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, excellent. From uh, 8 to 9 p.m. Central Standard. Thrifty Music Collectors Group, 
Tim Smith and Company. Um, my friend Doug Fields, Vinyl Grotto, I think he's talking about working on another one, if I remember correctly. So go like his page as well. Uh, Shindig. I forgot to bring the Shindig. I've got, finally, Barnes & Noble's got the Shindig magazine. But it seems like we're about a month or an issue behind. It's got the turtles on the cover. And uh, I'm reading that right now, actually. Very good. Maybe I'll show it for the 45 episode I'm going to probably do next. I'll bring that for the shindig so you guys can see that. Best damn English rock magazine, period. Okay? And uh, Records and Coffee, go check them out on Facebook. And uh, YouTube Vinyl Community. Without the YouTube Vinyl Community, none of us would be here. We wouldn't be able to do uh, what we love the most. And you know what, VC? Honestly, I really love you guys. I do. I do. All of you guys, I am so grateful and thankful for. By the way, I'll throw this out there really, really quick. I did pass the 450 sub mark, and I, I'm very thankful for that, too. Heading towards 500 would be really, really nice. Um, I think we're looking at, out of all honesty, probably a couple more episodes, at least maybe two I'm not sure. I'm trying to get to 195 before there'll be a brief hiatus. I'll try to announce it when it gets closer to time because uh, we're getting close to the moving time here. And uh, I already know what room I'm taking. This is going to be kind of a nice little room for me, I think. I've been wanting this for so long. Um, and maybe I'll have things a little bit more sorted out for you guys. But please, if you haven't done it yet, like and sub the channel. And until next time, uh, like I said, either it'll be a 45s episode coming up next or a CD review. I haven't figured out which one yet, okay? Take care, God bless, rock on, and I'll see you next time. Indeed.